Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion Show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who are more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams, and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization. It's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. Hello, this is the Green Corner Rebellion Show, and I am here with Mary, Senator Mary Boren who is one of my favorite state senators here in Oklahoma. She represents District 16 out in the Norman area. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Hanging in there. That's good. So first question I have here is where are you from and where did you grow up at? Where am I from? Well... Um, I guess the most direct way to say where I'm from is from Tillman County, Tipton near Frederick, and Altus, Wichita Falls area. Okay. I was born in Abilene, but my fa my mother and dad relocated from Tennessee, and when they relocated, um, like they moved from Tennessee, and they were the first of their family since like 1812 something like that to leave Tennessee so actually dad had somebody that went to Texas in that war that people got land mm -hmm. can't remember the war the name of the war so anyway dad went to Abilene to college and then that brought us west and then we migrated into t southwest Oklahoma and that's where I graduated high school in Tipton Oklahoma Graduated with 34, and then I went to Cameron and got a communications degree in Lawton. And then everybody told me I should go to law school. So I said, okay, I'll try that. And I went to law school at OU, and that's where I met my husband. He was an undergrad at OU. Right. Then I got stuck in Norman. That's how that worked. That's cool. And then what did you do before running for office? You became a lawyer, yeah. correct? I, yeah, I did a ton of things. Um, so I got my law degree in 1992. I became a mom in 95. My first little kiddo went, started school in 2000 and, um, about 2004. Yeah, I think it was like 2004, 2005. He was, um, diagnosed as having an expressive language delay, which that put him on an IEP. And I became really, you know, always cared about education because I worked at the State Department of Ed and the state regents right out of law school. And so when um, he needed some like extra advocacy help, then I um, became really interested in just education advocacy and all that. So I um, then became certified as a school teacher, uh, and then I got certified as a school counselor, and I started working. I shifted from child advocacy in the courtroom to the classroom, and I shifted over into the classroom. And then the you know everything hit the fan with the teachers and how they were treated, and I ran for office to try to advocate for kids in schools. All right, so that's the reason why you ended up running for office. That was my next Yeah, question. part of it, too, part of it, too, was I wanted to run campaigns differently, you know, like the Bernie model and the Barack Obama model. I didn't see a lot of that in Oklahoma. We still had the kind of older, um, top-down, that, that kind of model where 
you had like some political operative that managed the campaign and they managed the candidate, um, but there wasn't a real successful grassroots uh, field initiative. So I wanted to run a campaign the way I wish Democrats would run in Oklahoma. So that was part of it. And then I also needed to see the people that really cared in the same way I did. And I needed to find out who these people were because then, then I knew I would feel less um, hopeless if I got to meet them. So like I wanted to meet people like you, Gregory. <laughs> Well, that's great. I like that. That's that's interesting. That's kind of why I want to eventually run someday is because of um, Bernie Sanders definitely uh, influenced me wanting to eventually go into politics and how he ran his campaign and what his campaign was based on. So, yeah, I like I like that. Um, so say what? Are you a notary? I am not. You should get. You should become a notary and volunteer to notarize ballots. There's a big need. I probably should. Uh, what are some things you're proud of accomplishing or being a part of during your time in office? Um, something I was really happy about the other day. Let me think. Oh, we got the cola passed. Happy about that. Um, there's some small bills I'm happy about. We kind of helped out some, um, farm to table farmers uh, they have a co-op and it's where they're able to sell their, the things that they cook and the things that they make with their fresh farm produce, but they were kind of hitting some bureaucratic snags. And we got those smoothed out for them. So that was good. Um, we've also killed um, the tax credit scholarship through a lot of activism um, that I'm feeling grateful for. Um, oh, I got a law passed. I, I got a, a, a a law amended to clarify that you can give stamps to people who vote without it being a felony because it was a felony to give it is a felony to give somebody a thing of value to incentivize them to register to vote or to vote mm -hmm. and so there was some confusion of whether or not you could give somebody a stamp to put on their envelope to mail in their ballot and what we realized, at, so there, because that confusion was happening, a lot of activists were afraid to give stamped envelopes or give envelopes or notaries. If they notarize a ballot, could they give a, a stamp for their envelope? And so um, we were changing the election laws, and it was while we were um, all working from home. And I saw that this one bill was popping back up where I could sneak it to ask to put in that language and get the amendment. So I um, prepared an amendment from my house in my bedroom and put it on PDF and texted it to Cindy Munson because it was over in the house and she introduced it at the house level and got it passed and Kay Floyd over on the Senate side was getting it cleared through Senator Treat that it wouldn't make him mad about us amending his bill and he said he was okay with it and so Cindy Munson got it passed through the house it came over to the Senate and it passed so now notaries when they do a, like a drive-by notary event or if they do an event with a tent they can give the person two stamps for their envelope all right that's cool um so tell me what's going on at the capitol currently um could you, you tell me what happened on? tell me you know so, i don't actually i mean i've been paying some attention like what, what are you the, what, the, what's hit your radar so the budget 
I know that there was an issue with Kevin St- um, vetoing the original budget that you guys passed, and then I didn't hear about it ever again. <laughs> tell me, tell me what a like if I said they're in a rooster fight or they're in a pissing contest. What's another way, a colloquial way to say that? I mean, flexing on each other. They're kind of flexing on each other. So that's what's yeah. So yeah. McCall and Treat and Governor Stead are all flexing on each other. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what? What was his, what was Kevin Stead's issue with the um, budget that y'all passed? Um, I think he didn't like how, I don't know, because I'm a Democrat, so I wasn't in the room when they were all fussing about that, but um, he didn't like McCall's. He didn't get some of the money that he wanted to go in the direction that he wanted it to go in. Mm-hmm. So um, he wanted more freedom and flexibility with some money. Um, so okay. they just had a different okay. view. He wanted to save a whole lot more back. And mm-hmm. the legislature wanted to be able to kind of fund some more priorities of the Republican Party. Um, So, Ed McCall, the governor just um, vetoed, like, it looks like he's just going through McCall's bills and vetoing those. (laughs) So, yeah, I don't think that's a good game plan. I don't think the governor understands that the Speaker of the House has a whole lot of power. I don't think the governor understands much of anything. <laughs> but um but I think, yeah. I think he kind of leads like a good life group leader mm-hmm. or a family owned business leader. You can see those elements, but he doesn't know how to trust people who are outside of that fraternity or that that I don't know. Because you know how you can trust somebody outside of what you, of course you, you, Gregory, you totally know how to do this. You know how, who you can trust that doesn't really get you, but you know you can trust them and work with them. Yeah. I don't think he knows that. Like mm-hmm. he, the only people he trusts are people that are pretty much the same version of him, but just maybe a little bit different. Yeah, it's kind of like the businessman aspect of him, in a way. Yeah. 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 And it's also the Tulsa church guy, too. Life group leader. Have you Mm -hmm. ever been in a life group? It's very common in white evangelical churches. So you'll have, like, big, like, life church, big Mm -hmm. mega church. And then they'll have people that get trained to do life groups. And life groups often meet in homes. So it's just like hanging out with each other. So you will hang out with each other once a week and go to fireworks activities. Like if there's a fireworks picnic on 4th of July, you'll all go together as a life group. Or if somebody has a birthday party, they'll go to each other's birthday party. So it's like creating this Christian hangout club thing. And you also do devotionals and you pray for each other and you have prayer requests. So you follow each other's life over. Mm -hmm. uh, Because it's kind of basically recreating kind of what you would have in a smaller town or towns where people never moved around. And so you kind of have that continuity of life. Well, um, life groups is something in suburban areas where people don't have that, that same stuff. And so they'll usually have a, so the life group leader would be somebody that kind of plans the events and encourages each other and mm-hmm. keeps everybody uh, motivated and feel like they belong and all that. But it's a very, um, I don't know, it kind of, it's more intimate and you hold more accountability with each other. That way you like, you really know you belong. Yeah. But the people that are outside the group would feel like, 
well, I don't belong in that group. I don't fit in. I'm not part of that. And I think sometimes the governor runs things like he's in a, he's wanting to create this life group and he's a, unaware of the people that don't fit in that he still has to serve and that he still has to listen to and he still has to consider their ideas. But I think he has a high distrust. I mean, he treats them nicely, but he doesn't have the ability to really fairly consider their perspective. That makes sense. Yeah. So what were some things that you would have liked to see allocated in the budget that probably weren't? Well, uh, let me think. It's that we have so much just core problems, like we didn't take Medicaid match. So we've been, that's a huge pot of money that we could have been using. Mm-hmm. Um, we could have gotten rid of the capital gains tax and gave us another million dollars. I would have liked for textbooks to be fully funded. I think the State Department of Education said that they needed 39 million or 44 million to fully fund books, but they're going we just allocated 33 million like we have for the last 15 years. So that's disappointing. Um, trying to think. A lot of people don't realize that the textbooks is a constitutional right in Oklahoma, that our the Oklahoma state constitution says that students are entitled to a free textbook. Hmm. So I know. I didn't know that. And a lot of people don't. So, um, like we have a constitutional requirement to do that and we don't. We don't fully mm-hmm. fund it. So I think that would have been better. Would have, you know, with the COVID-19 and our economy and our basis of revenue being whacked, almost chopped off by a third. This time next year, our economy is going to be in a world of hurt. Yeah. So um, you can't be too... Uh, eager to fund everything you're not going to be able to fund everything like you would normally want so it's more of structural support so that you'll be able to weather the storm that we're about to happen that's about to happen so I would have liked to had more infrastructure into building projects and keeping the economy going for all these people that are unemployed that they would have a place to land Mm -hmm. you could have done we could have done that through bond issues and things like that which we didn't do so I have a question is there so like we have this issue in Oklahoma over the last 10 or 15 years where a lot of our hospitals have closed in the rural areas is there a way that the state of Oklahoma could build hospitals and give people jobs building hospitals in the rural areas is that something that the state could do um, I'm not real. The person you need to interview about that is Julia Kurt, and she would come on to your show. I'm sure she would. Um, just email her. And she knows all about our bonding capacity, and that's that would be a bond of some mm-hmm. kind. But yes, the state of Oklahoma can issue bonds like you do a bond election for schools. The state mm-hmm. has that capacity, too, and could do that. If they wanted to. And the thing is, is that the reason why we don't have hospitals is not because we don't have buildings. Yeah. The building part is not the problem. The problem is that when you care for somebody that has diabetes and comes in frequently and they're uninsured and you're in rural Oklahoma and let's say you have... 35% of your patients are uninsured diabetic patients. You can't make money. And the cost of doing things goes way up. Mm -hmm. The way insurance is and the way those procedures are. So that creates the reason why those hospitals are closed is that there's not the money that needs to flow into keeping the people um, hired and, um, and keep um, 
the nurses hired and all the staff hired and all that, all that money that funds that in other states is not flowing in that direction because we didn't take Medicaid match and we don't have a lot of uh, health insurance providing companies that provide, you know, really good insurance. We might have some people and we have a lot of people in Oklahoma that have insurance, but their deductibles are really, really high. And so they still can't go to the doctor. So when they do go, then they have to take care of 14 things at once. And the doctor says, I only have 15 minutes to see you and I can't see all your level three awful things. So the reason the hospitals in rural Oklahoma have declined is that there's not a sustainable source of financing health care for poorer people or sparsely populated people. Okay. Um, so would you like to talk about the bill that the legislature passed that reinstated the notary requirement for the mail-in ballots? Yeah, um, that was Senate Bill 210. I voted against it and I debated against it. And it was pretty disappointing. It also opens up these pathways for people that are have immune compromised conditions that only l exist through June 30th, which is frustrating because there's still going to be people with immune compromised problems or issues after June 30th. So why did those accommodations just all of a sudden evaporate? They didn't just get healed. Yeah. So that's frustrating to me. Um, Senate Bill 1779, I did vote for because that's where my stamp thing got in. When I was debating against 210, I asked Senator Treat, I said, you didn't deal with ballot harvesting. And most people think that the, the problem with mail-in ballots is because of all this ballot harvesting. Do you know what ballot harvesting is? No, it's that. Uh... Do you know do you know what happened to the governor's race in Georgia with voter fraud? Did you follow that much? Not exactly. No. Okay. What happened? Well, there's a lot of things that happened, but they did catch this one lady who had been going door to door offering to mail in people's ballots, their mm -hmm. ballots, and she didn't. She just collected them all and put them in the Oh wow. Like, she got paid to go pick up ballots <clears throat> and not mail them. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So that's called ballot harvesting. Uh, and, and it the law is that you cannot mail someone else's ballot in for them or collect it and mail it in for them unless they're really closely related. Mm -hmm. Because stuff like that. So there are going to be some people that go, oh, I'll go mail this for you. And the... The, the rule is like, no, that's not helpful. So, anyway, that got addressed in Senate Bill 1779. Because um, we kind of have two things going on with the around mail-in ballots. Is that there's a big part, there's a big suspicion that's perpetuated by Fox News and the Republican Party right now that mail-in ballots are fundamentally flawed and they're not safe and you can't do it securely. Uh -huh. So, and then they'll point to these things like the lady in Georgia that collected all these ballots and mailed them in. Well, the answer to that is to say you can't do ballot harvesting and it's wrong and to educate the population of people that, um, that ain't cool. You don't brush, you know, you don't brush somebody else's teeth. You don't mail their ballot in for them either. And, so that's kind of that's that's one thing that's going on with it. The other thing that's going on with it is that people are feeling nervous about going to the polls and we need to make it so where that they can participate in voting without exposing themselves to COVID-19. And now we also have Senate a state question 802 on the ballot this June 30th. Yeah. 
Um, I find that kind of odd that <clears throat> the Republicans would, because uh, what was Kevin said, was taking forever to decide when he would put it on the ballot, uh, 802. Mm-hmm. And then the Republicans decided, oh, we're going to try to make it harder for people to vote during a pandemic in order for people to get health care. <laughs> it's like, I know. It's yeah. Just really- of course, Oklahoma would do that. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's just way too much all at one time. It is way too much all at one time. How do you deal with that when that happens to you? When you get way too much all at one time, you feel really overwhelmed. I just don't deal with it. <laughs> just you walk just pull away. Back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I agree. You got to get that worked out before you run for office. Cause I know. I know. <laughs> you gotta build I, up your tolerance <laughs> I know I'm trying to um, you want yeah. to speak to Gregory say Nathan. what my husband just walked in the room I was gonna ask if you want to say hi to you oh he doesn't <laughs> <laughs> tell him I said hi well this is my husband yeah here he is he's Hello. coming around come around I didn't see him. Here he is. There he is. There he is. Hey. (laughs) You fake him. Wait, where am I? What the heck? This is, I got a fake background. Okay, can you see? see. Yeah, hi. Hey. (laughs) He's doing a Skype interview. Oh, good. And he has people asking questions, so. That's cool. What did you think about the Twitch thing? The Twitch thing? Yeah, with uh, Nick. Uh, that was great. I really liked that. Can I tell uh, you what happened right before that? I was running up the Capitol because I was out with the uh, the unemployment protesters. Mm-hmm. And I brought, them a, I brought them my tent and my chairs because I didn't want them standing out in the sun. And the legislature wasn't in session. And I had this interview done ready at 12. And they were getting there like at 12. And so I had to meet them early and then I had to blaze up the stairs with some flowers. I think I did bring my flowers up. They gave me this big old bouquet of flowers and I had to set everything up. Well, all I had, I had him on my phone because I was trying not to miss the deadline, but I couldn't figure out how to um, situate my phone on Twitch to do this interview. And my phone kept sliding so that's why the camera was just going everywhere. And I felt really bad about it because I didn't want that to be. I wanted to use my laptop like I am with you. So mm-hmm. you just yeah. have to plan better to get everything set up ahead of time. So, yeah. But, yeah, I thought it was I thought it was really great. You guys got to talk about um, the different bills and all that good stuff. It was really informative. Nick is really one of the most well-read, prepared people to talk about Oklahoma politics with, like to carry on. It's like he knows just, he knows as much as people that are in the building know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He picks up on, he reads a lot, he reads the bills. So that's kind of hard to do because you have to go find it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. I like what he's doing with uh, Oklahoma Progress now. Yeah. Do you? How do you think that we can bring more young people into that political talk world? Um. Uh, well, one way is through things like Twitch and YouTube and the internet and stuff like that. Um podcasts because i know a lot of people my age if they're getting their news it's probably going to be from the internet um like through youtube or something like that <clears throat> so that's one way as well, far we, as well, me and you do like a, a morning news podcast that would be interesting <laughs> or at end of the day we should probably do it end of the day end of the day would probably be better yeah what kind of pod- news podcast do you listen to? Oh, I listen to quite a few, probably too many. Um, I listen to Majority Report. That's like every day. Um, when you talk about the news, they usually interview someone right. at the beginning. We could do hours. We could do hours 
the minority report. <laughs> or um, in Oklahoma, I'm in the yeah. minority party yeah. and get my butt kicked every freaking day. <laughs> that could work. But yeah. <laughs> There's a little but, yeah. inner uh, sectionality going on between, you know, what it feels like between yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I have, let's see here. Okay. You two more questions here. Okay. Say what? Ask okay. questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So the session's not over, right? Like there's still okay, so more. We, did, we, we did, the Senate did signy die, mm-hmm. which meant we're done with our stuff, but the governor so we got done with our stuff and we put all of our bills out to the governor and he had a certain amount of time to veto those. But what we did is that we got him, we saved enough time before the session closes for the, like, I guess there's a session closing time and the Senate's work is done. But the session closes by law where you can't deal with anything um, without calling a special session the Friday before Friday at five before Memorial Day. And so we're going to go back in Friday and vote on all the governor's vetoes. Okay. So, so the Senate and the legislature is done with our work, but we still have some session left over that we can still act on the overriding of the vetoes. Okay. And I think the way they did it, like I'm not the parliamentarian, so I don't know. You should always tweet and ask all of the questions to Sean Ashley on E Capital Sean Ashley. Mm-hmm. He's a great parliamentarian. He was I went to Cameron with him and he was on the debate team with me at Cameron. And he scared everybody. Nobody wanted to go up against him. He was just a beast. And um, but I can ask him, what's the rule on this? And he's like Sheldon or like he knows everything. Off the top of his head. So he knows all the history, he knows all of it. So that would be a good question. It was like, so when we gaveled out, we gaveled out with the condition that we could come back if we needed to. It's like, okay. we're signy die unless the governor does something, and then we can come back. That was, it was like a conditional signy die. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, okay, I think I have two more questions. So, there's another question just came to my head. So, what do, so there's an issue now with people about to be evicted because they haven't been able to pay their rent because people have been losing their jobs. So is the state legislature going to do anything about that at all? Well, it's within the governor's power to extend his emergency order to prevent uh, evictions from proceeding. He could do that and wait for the next batch of CARES Act money comes to the state that will go into uh, community block grants. And to those organizations that have been doing uh, homeless prevention work during the pandemic. So that's what I wish he would do. But Okay. Because I was seeing some stuff on Facebook and Twitter. And it's just like, I cannot believe that people are about to be evicted after being unemployed for two months. And some people haven't even got their check. Yeah. And they haven't been able to get their benefits. They're waiting. My my uh my inbox is full i mean I, I i'm so tired and worn out by trying to keep up with all these you know to respond to all these claims and it's just i can't even describe to you how broken it is it's so exhausting but the the computer systems are bad osbi is investigating this nigerian fraud um group that got access to people's um information and filed fraudulent claims um 
the software's bad. The people who answer the phones don't know how to answer questions. They hang up on people. They don't call people back. The debit card company that's a vendor, third-party vendor that the state contracted with, they don't have good customer service. They don't send in cards on time. The, the whole system between the state and this third-party vendor doesn't work with um, getting the money to them in a timely way. That's crazy. It's really bad. And I told people, I'm like, our OESC system was like an old pickup in the front yard that needed two tires replaced and the engine overhauled and the starter didn't only worked, you know, every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And then we're trying to run it in the Indy 500. Wow. That's horrible. It's, it's... And we keep looking and screaming at the car for not working. Like, why are y'all screaming at this car for not working and driving an Indy at 500? We just need to go to the car dealer and just buy a Camry. Yeah. So or, or Cavalier. A Chevy Cavalier. Yeah. Or Chevy Cavalier. That'll work, too. Is that what you drive? I used to. Uh, before I had a wreck a few years ago. But yeah, I used to drive a Chevy Cavalier 96. Well, did you survive your wreck? I guess you did. I did. I wasn't, I mean, my leg, like I couldn't walk on my leg for a few days, but it wasn't like broken or anything. It was just like, I guess kind of shaken out of place or whatever. But other than that, it was fine. Just the car wasn't fine. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. What do you it, drive now? It, I drive a 95 Chevy Beretta. Wow, that's old. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. What color is it? It's green. What color green? Like a forest green? or Like, is kind of like a green? Like a dark green-ish, but not too dark. Uh-huh. If that makes sense. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So last question I have here is what kind of music do you listen to? Oh, I listen. I'm so moody. Like when my music, it's so weird. I like it's a mix of what I'm trying to do with how I feel. Mm hmm. So there, I, and I have Spotify. Um, so when I'm trying to get, like right today, I was listening to, like to focus, I listen to classical or some kind of blend of classical. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also listen to um Sometimes I'll listen to, depending, like if I'm in an office and I'm not really able to get outside and see nature a lot, I'll play like music that has water in it or um, different nature sounds in it. There's a lot of that. And that's all to kind of stay chill and focus and not get like, where I'll, if I have to write a lot, I have certain music that I listen to if I'm having to construct written work, like if I'm preparing a debate or if I'm emailing a bunch of people I can't have words coming at me and then me trying to get my own words in my head I don't my words don't flow as well um but if I am recently I noticed with COVID-19 I just felt you know we, how have you been doing with that how emotionally how have you been has it been uh, you emotionally or I mean it's been it's been okay. It's been too bad. I mean, um, Are you am I working? No, because I was substitute teaching, and oh. then all the schools closed. So that was, you know, that was my income for those couple of months. <laughs> uh -huh. And then I was, I, I'm doing my show. I have a Patreon, so that's pretty much my only source of income right now. Is that what's <clears throat> This show that you're doing today, you get mm -hmm. money for? Mhm. Mm on Patreon, people can choose to support the show on Patreon, and yeah. that's pretty much 
my income right now and do you listen to Karen Hunter on Sirius Radio? Karen? I do not. You need to listen to her. She's got a really good show. And she's on every day for like two hours, I think, on Sirius Radio. Mm -hmm. And she's um, a college professor, published, you know, was a reporter for the New York Post, I think. Mm -hmm. So she's just really, really good. So I have Peaceful Guitar on Spotify that I listen to. I listen to Journey in the car going to get to drop off certificates for the Norman high school seniors. And Macy went with me and we went to old school bagel. So during that time in, we were in the car and it was hot mm -hmm. and journey was playing at old school bagel. So then I said, Oh, I want to listen to that. And then before that, I listened to surf rock sunshine and then yesterday, before my uh, training for notaries to know how to learn to notarize ballots, I listened to Social Justice and Humanity songs. And then what else? Also have, let's say, based on my, I'll listen to Motown in the winter when, you know, that time between Christmas and before Easter? Mm -hmm. that time I listen to Motown in the car a lot because it starts getting real dreary and one year I was like I've got to figure out something to do because during this time of year you're just so bummed out and you're just kind of wanting to and I'm like I need something that will help me kind of like dig down deep and get stronger so that when it's spring then I'm ready to go not just hold my breath and hope that I can just kind of eat a bunch of stuff and get, you know, out of shape. And so I said, what music is very resilient like that, that just kind of that internal motivation core kind of, I'm going to take care of me and get my stuff done and all that. And so uh, I realized that I really liked Motown for that, that kind of vibe of just remembering who you are and what you have to overcome and, you know, stick with it. It and that whole thing so and then at the capitol when i have to go into committee meeting and i'm totally going to be outnumbered and i'm going to have to kind of battle up against them and i listen to motown before that too and then today it looks like i also um oh one of my favorite <laughs> playlists right now on spotify is life sucks and <laughs> it's a uh, it's just these like I don't know. They're just like me. I don't know. I like it because that's what COVID-19 has done to me is like, man, this is really hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm also my dad has had a lot of health problems. And so I've been taking care of him and I love him. But trying I'm starting to feel overwhelmed by all the people that I'm so afraid that they're going to have their. They're going to be have their rent, you know their landlords are going to evict them and their cars are going to be repossessed. And my dad has health problems and COVID-19 and are we going to be okay? And will I ever be able to go out to a nice restaurant again? And so that's a real good, that's when I start feeling all of that. I play life sucks and it really kind of makes me feel better because the songs are pretty, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I just kind of like the songs. A lot of them I haven't heard before. So, what are you listening to? Ooh, I've been listening to. Let me see here. Made a playlist and tweeted it out a couple of days ago. <clears throat> um, yeah. Let's see here. But listening to a little bit of Breaking Benjamin. Um. There's this band. Okay, so do you remember the band Linkin Park? Yes. Okay, so their singer, the one that died a few years ago, he was in a band before Linkin Park. They've been releasing new music recently with him as the vocalist. Uh -huh. and so I've been listening to some of their stuff. Um, 
band called Hypervale, Fever333. Been really getting into this band called Knocked Loose. It's this hardcore band from California. You like hard rock, right? Or acid, yeah. you like acid rock? Do you like that rock where they growl into the microphone? Of course, yeah. <laughs> How does that, like, how do you know what you're listening to? I mean, you can look, you mean like what they're saying? Yeah. I mean, you can look up the lyrics. Like, they're, they're actually saying something most I of the time. I know they are, but. <laughs> you do- I mean, sometimes you can tell by ear, but sometimes you just have to look up the lyrics. Because, you know, sometimes it's just That's unintelligible. the only way that I would appreciate that music is through the reading the lyrics. Yeah. I mean, they're saying some pretty meaningful stuff sometimes. I know they are. I just can't hear past the screaming. Now, when you hear that, does that resonate with you in some way? Like, you wish you could scream into a microphone and tell the whole world to... (laughs) Yeah, of course. I kind of understand that. Yeah, I've been listening to... Let's see here. This band called Issues. Been listening to some Pantera, Seether... Stuff like that. You're a big, yeah. I, one thing I really like about you is how aware of music you are. Do, do you have any musical training? What kind of music stuff did you do in school? I played trumpet in from fifth through uh, senior year of high school. So I was in marching band and concert band. That was pretty much it as far as it was playing. Trumpet. Music. You played trumpet. Yeah, trumpet. That's my my daughter's boyfriend from California State Long Beach. She went to California State Long Beach and had to finish college in her bedroom. Um, she uh is dating a guy that is um from. He plays a trumpet too. Mhm. So that's cool. I wonder. Yeah. If that, I'm trying to look for this one song that I really like. It might be it. I'll tell you what it is. Can you hear it? Yeah. Just a second. It's Jamila Woods waiting for. It's got a really, really neat middle part. Really mm-hmm. like it. So anyway, that kind of popped up on one of my lists. So right now I want to hear steel drums. I want to hear, I don't like drum kits mm-hmm. in anything. If it has a drum kit in it, hmm. there's a, I have to be in a very specific mood for that. I like really good bass lines. Yeah. Um. Um, what else? I don't, I'm really more acoustic. I like, I don't like overly processed, um, voices. Mm -hmm. I lean towards, I lean really towards acoustic. So if it's not acoustic, it has to have a certain purpose. I don't like it to be overly manufactured, so... That's interesting. Yeah, I like I like bass lines, but I only like them when they're like funk influence. Yeah, oh, I love yeah. Yeah. It yeah. has to, yeah. And the, when I said bass line, I'm really I'm like, oh, you like funk. There's another playlist on uh, Spotify right now called Butter. Mhm. And I really like it. It's um it's got, it's really leans towards funk, but it is a kind of easy listening funk. So mm-hmm. it's more, I don't know, it's like, it's more airy, it has more air to it than um, typical funk, but you can hear those lines kind of coming through. So I like it too. So. Those have been that's been fun to listen to that. But I man, I tell you what, I'll spend like 35 minutes trying to find the perfect channel on Spotify mm-hmm. before I can get to doing my job. 
And if I if I find myself, Mary, you can't spend two hours trying to find the perfect station to go with what you're working on in your mood, then I typically go back to jazz mm -hmm. and like what uh, Miles Davis or Wynton Marcellus or um, like piano jazz, like two or three instrument jazz. That's usually like, or I'll go to um, like Mozart or something very classical that I know what I'm going to get and I don't have to like think about it anymore. If yeah. I have to get work done, yeah, that's what I'll do. Yeah. Yeah, that was one thing, like, when I was in high school, we were able to take jazz band, but I decided not to, and then whenever I got into college, I got into this band, so they're like a new metal core type band where there's a lot of jazz influence in their, in their music, and so that kind of got me thinking, like, oh, I wish I kind of gotten into jazz band whenever I was in high school, so yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Jazz is really cool. Have you taken any jazz appreciation at all classes or anything? I want to say I did when I was at band camp, but that was like in high school. There's a, um, there is a, a movie, a documentary about Miles Davis. Have you seen it? I don't think so. No. You need to watch it. <clears throat> I mean, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so good. But there's one part of it. They talk about his whole life. His dad was a dentist. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. So his hmm. dad was a dentist, and he went to Juilliard. But then he dropped out and went off to do something else. But um, he was so good. But he would take his trumpet and just go out in the woods and just try to mimic all the sounds he heard in nature. Mm hmm and um, but the most fascinating thing that came out of that whole deal, it just shocked me, was he was in France and, um, of course, loved it. And this was the time when at that time in America, the, the Jim Crow South was just awful. And you go to France and you just felt like, oh, I don't have to deal with all this crap that I've been dealing with. You know, it was just eye opening, like, oh, that's much why, you know, that's a much better way to be treated. And mm -hmm. um, so he got hired to um, um, do the soundtrack for this movie, this French movie. And he did it. Um, but he, um, he uh, did it without music. Hmm. And what he did, I think it's, I think that's it. Smalls Davis, right? He was the guy that was. Yeah, that was him. Um, it's on Netflix. Anyway, he did this whole sound script where he watched the movie and played his trumpet, and his band played along, improvised mm -hmm. as he watched the scene unfold. The whole movie. That's interesting. And they show this one scene of this lady, like, walking. And that soundtrack for that movie, that record, was, uh, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so good. So I went and found it online and put it on my Spotify list. And, and I, you know what? I won't listen to that with anybody around me that stresses me out. <laughs> Do you do that with certain music? It's like, I don't want you to mess up this song for me. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I'm usually alone if I listen to music anyway. So, like, I'm usually, I'm usually either in the car, just in my room, or whenever I'm doing something around the house or whatever, I'm usually by myself. So, yeah. But, like, like if something was, like, I don't know, really, really meaningful and special to you that provides you so much um stress relief i don't want a stressful person around me mm -hmm. because then i'll start associating that music yeah. with that person mm -hmm. and i'm like and i found myself twice i'm like oh i don't want to listen to that too. well like this is like to 
get away from the world, like escape. I have escape music, and I don't want the worries of the my world coming into my escape music. Mm-hmm. So I keep those separate. I found that out about myself this year. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. Where can I we find it. you? Where thank can you for inviting find... me. You're welcome. Where can we find you on social media? Maryborn.com. And all you need to vote is is on my website. I turned my first page into voting like stuff. Um, the first two pages on my web page are voting stuff. Um, you can find me there. I'm all over Facebook. You can just Google Mary Boren. You'll find me. Um, I have a Senate Facebook page. And then my personal page, I try to I try not to talk politics on my personal page because a lot of people get creeped out about politics. And I try not to talk about church stuff on my Senate page. But sometimes there is an intersection that you do have to, like, address it. But I tend mm-hmm. not to post Bible verses or whatever over on my Senate page because people want to interact with me in a more um, separation of church and state kind of world. Yeah. And that's kind of how I do it in my life is – I do my faith more, but it's not thick. Even in my personal stuff, it's not real thick. It's not. Now, on when it comes to voting, I'll do it on both. So if it's like when to vote, how to vote, how to get registered, it'll be on both websites. All and right. so and then I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I have a Twitch account, which is Vote Louder Mary. But I don't know what to do with my Twitch account other than watch Nick Springer. Uh, Singer, sorry, Nick Singer. Singer. Yeah. yeah, I'll watch him. But um, I have Instagram. I have Snapchat, but I don't do it much. I just follow Macy, my daughter, mainly. Um, and she gets mad at me because I always do the filters, and she thinks it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you stay in touch. I will. Lots of work to do till until November, don't we? Yeah. Do you know how many days until the inauguration of the next president? Mm, I'd say less than 200. No, for it's sure. about 245. Okay. I have a countdown. Okay, that makes sense then. Yeah. It's because, in January, yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, I can live, I could get through this until January. It's not that far off. And then November... And I just hope we can hang on between November and January. No telling what Donald Trump will do between November and January. Yeah. Ugh. Hope we can live through that. So. No, no telling what he'll do in between now and I November. I know. Imagine <laughs> what he would do if he won again. Oh wow. That that I know you want to think about. Four more years with nothing to. I'd like to hope that the Republicans would actually impeach him then. <laughs> but, Just because they're sick of him being around? <laughs> well, then, yeah. Then they let Mike Pence get in, and then Mike Pence could run. And yeah. you know, maybe in their brain, they'd say, oh, we would get more eight more years of Pence. So, yeah, whatever. because technically, if Trump gets reelected, and then they impeach Trump in, like, the first year, then Pence will get to serve out the rest of that four years, and then we'll technically get to run for two other terms because Is that right. That first that term, how that works? Yeah, yeah, because that first term doesn't count towards his two terms. Yeah, I didn't know that. You can, yeah, something. because you have, yeah, because you have to be elected. You can only oh. be elected for two terms, not inherit. Term. <laughs> yeah, exactly. well, see, that sounds like a good plan for Mitchell McConnell. We should get him to. <laughs> Mitch, you could get 12 years of pence. <laughs> but whatever. Well, it's good talking to you. It's nice talking to you, too. Bye. Hey, Mitch, we'll keep you busy. All right.